Thank you, Takeo. Direct manipulation is everywhere. Sorry, is this on? It's working. Did, I, did it go on? There we go. Excellent. All right, direct manipulation is everywhere. Direct manipulation is, uh, the, is standard in a number of domains, and for most people, it's the expected way that they interact with computers. In contrast, program, programming languages can also be used to construct artifacts if one has the secret knowledge of how to write code. Programming is powerful, but it's arcane. Could we combine these experiences? Could we have a system where you write your code, and then when you see that the output is wrong, it's always wrong, um, you could directly manipulate the output to uh, in, enact a program repair? This is the vision we want to advance in this work. We want to start with ordinary text-based programming language and then extend it with direct manipulation features at any point during the program construction so that you can always repair your program from the output. And we call this output-directed programming. Now, we're not the first. There have been a number of direct output-directed programming systems over the years. And in most of these systems, you would write up your code first. And then, at that point, you could make some tiny tweaks to your program using direct ma manipulation. A few of these systems also have some program construction features as well. In all cases, you are expected to revert back to text editing your program when the direct manipulation features aren't good enough. But we want to push this as far as possible. So we are going to forbid text editing and ask the question, what kind of programs could you construct entirely through direct manipulation on the output? And to do this, we're going to build on some prior work. And we're going to start with the Sketch and Sketch editor for uh, making programs that draw SVG vector graphics. Now, Sketch and Sketch already had a number of output directed programming features in it. So, for example, you could draw on your canvas to insert shape definitions into your program. And when you had the shapes in your program, you could drag them around, which would change the appropriate numbers in, in your program. You could also snap features together. So here we're going to try and snap the, the, that line to that corner of that rectangle. And these snaps are enforced by inserting variables into your program, which are then shared between uh, the two locations. All right. And then like a traditional graphics editor, you could also take several shapes, select them, and then put them together into a group, which becomes a single definition in your program. And then you could take your group, you could abstract it into a function, which would allow you to draw more copies of your design. All right. So you could do all that with direct manipulation. What, what, what's there left to do? Well, it turns out that as implemented, a lot of these tools were a bit too rigid. They depended on certain program structures. And then there were also certain designs that you just really couldn't do with the, the direct manipulation. So here, we're trying to make a rhombus, and we're failing. So as we thought about this rhombus and other designs that we wanted to be able to create using only direct manipulation, we had two insights. First. The prior sketch and sketch only let you manipulate the final output of your program. But for many programs, the interesting part of the program is not the final output, but all the computation that leads up to that final output. So can we manipulate that as well? So in this work, we are going to put widgets on the canvas that allow you to manipulate some of the intermediate pro ex execution products of your program. And then also, when you're working on a program, you don't always want to think about the entire program at once. Sometimes you want to just think, of, think about one definition at a time. So we're going to let the user focus their editing on a single definition or a single function in their programming to enact changes just within that, that scope. And then our second insight, as we thought about the kinds of transformations that you do uh, on these shape drawing programs, we realized that actually these transformations, a lot of them are not just specific to shape drawing programs. So let's see if we can embrace generic programmatic concepts as much as possible. So for example, when you click something in the output, you need some way to translate uh, what you clicked in the output back to the, the piece of the code that you want to change. So we're going to rely on a generic provenance tracing scheme that traces the dependencies as your program runs. Now, we're not going to talk about this. Um, uh, it's behind the scenes. But what's interesting to note is that the, the, pro the tracing that we're using is not specific to graphics. It doesn't have graphics-specific concepts encoded in, in it. But more visibly, it turns out that you know, the standard kinds of refactorings you would do in IntelliJ or Eclipse, like rename a variable, add an argument to a function, you also want to be able to do these when you're making shape drawing programs. So we're going to try and expose some of these refactorings on, um, in, in our system so that you can just click on things in the output and, uh, and create these refactorings. All right. 
So when we put all these features together, what kinds of designs can we make? We can do uh, several designs using only output-directed uh, interactions. And today, we'll make one of them. We're going to make this leaf here, which is a rhombus with two veins in it, in it like so. And our design will be a function, so we can quickly create uh, different variations uh, of it. Now, earlier I said, oh, you can't make a rhombus. Well, once you expose intermediate execution products through widgets, you can. We're going to start from a center point. We'll add and subtract to get the corners of, uh, of the rhombus. And then we'll attach a polygon to those corners and then draw the veins. All right, let's get started. All right, so here's the Sketch and Sketch interface. On the left is a code box, just a standard text editor here. The language here is a simple functional language that looks like Elm. On the right is where our output will appear, along with the widgets for inter manipulating the intermediates. Now, we said we wanted to start from a center point, so what we could do is we could text edit here. I could right, say point is uh, the definition of pair 100, 100, all right. And then when I run the program, we'll see a point appear on the canvas. But what's interesting here is that this point, this definition here, this variable, is dead code. It's not being used anywhere. The shape list at the end of our program is still blank. This is a program that doesn't have any output. What's happening is the evaluator, as it runs our program, it sees a number number pair. And whenever it sees a number number pair, it emits a point widget on the canvas so that we can manipulate these numbers using the, the, the point widget. All right, I said we weren't going to do text edits. So let's go back, start over. And then instead, we'll use a pointer offset tool here that will allow us to click on the canvas to insert a point definition into our program. OK, we have our center point. We want to uh, make the corners by adding or subtracting from it. Adding or subtracting from a coordinate is common in, uh, in, in graphics applications. So our pointer offset tool let us drag on the canvas. And when we let go, an offset is put into our program, which is just an x or y coordinate plus a certain amount. And then the Sketch and Sketch evaluator, when it sees an x or y coordinate plus or, plus or minus a certain amount, it will emit an offset, which, it, which is an arrow onto the canvas that will allow us to manipulate that offset. All right. So let's go and, and do the, the other additions and subtractions here. Let's go the other direction here. If we draw the offset the same amount as before, Sketch and Sketch will insert a shared vari variable for us and use it as the offset amount for both of our offsets so that they're always the same. All right. Now let's draw the vertical and the offset similarly, up and down, make sure they're the same amount. We get another variable. It's called num2. All right, so there we go. We have the skeleton for our design, but these names are not great. Num, num2, not great names. Well, if I was in an ordinary IDE, I would want to be able to you know, invoke a rename refactoring. I mean, let's do that, but we're, instead of doing it over here, we're going to do it from the output. We'll just go ahead and click on one of the labels, and I'll rename it to half w for half width, hit return, and that in, um, performs a, just a generic rename refactoring on my code, and so I can use this to clean up my code, and I'll call the, the vertical offsets half h. There we go. So that's the first example of a generic refactoring that you can invoke from the output. Let's go ahead and attach a polygon to these corners now so that we can have a rhombus. So I'll click the top corner, the right corner, the bottom corner, the left corner. Come on, there we go. And then close the polygon up here. All right. And the, when the polygon definition is, is inserted into our program, you can see that it's, it's using these variables that were, that were already defined um, so that when we try and resize the polygon, it still stays, stays the rhombus shape. All right. We'll go ahead and make that color just a little bit different here. And then we're going to draw the first of our stylized veins on the polygon. I'll grab the line tool and drag from the bottom up, up to there. And we'll see it inserts a line definition into our program. We'll add the other vein in a moment. But at this point, what we're going to think about wanting to do is we want to take these two shapes, this rhombus and this line, and we want to put them in, together into a group, kind of like in a standard uh, graphics editor. But we want to embrace generic programming concepts. So rather than having a SVG-specific group concept, if I select the rhombus, select the line, and ask Sketch and Sketch to group these for me, all it's going to do is put them in a list. We're in a programming language. Groups are lists. There we go. So now we have our shapes in a list. The next thing we want to do is we're using a programming language. We'd really like to make a function so that we can make various copy copies of our design. I want to be able to take this list and make it the return value of my function. So I need some way to select this list in the output. So the way we do that is you may see all these borders appearing and disappearing. These dotted borders here are list widgets. These list widgets are emitted any time the evaluator sees a list, and they allow us to select the lists in our program. Now, these shapes participate in a number of lists. That's why there's quite a few list widgets here. 
But if we hover over, we can see which list it is. And this is the one we want. So we'll select that list. That's what we want the return value of our function to be. And then we'll use the abstracts tool and turn our, 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 uh, our group into a function. Now, this abstract tool actually just perform an, a relatively ordinary abstract, uh, extract method refactoring where it used the free variables to figure out how to build a function. And we use the heuristic that definitions with free variables are pulled into the function, and definitions without free variables are left outside of the function and become the parameters to the function. In this case, that makes, builds a function with the parameters of the center point and then the half width and the half height here. Sketch and Sketch's type inference notices that this is a function that takes a point and a horizontal distance and a vertical distance, and it's therefore exposed for us as a, as a custom drawing tool. So we can actually click our function in the toolbox and uh, insert more calls to our function into the program just by drawing. All right. All right. Now, we said we wanted to make some sort of leafy rhombus with two veins in it. It still only has one vein. Um, we need to add the other vein. But if I just draw the line here on the canvas, it's going to be insert the line at the top level of my program. But my group is actually here inside the function. So how am I going to add it to the function? This is where we need to focus our editing on just a single definition in, in the program. The way we do that is we can hover over one of these shapes. And amidst all the dotted list widgets here, one of these borders um, is solid, and that's a call widget representing a function call in the program. When I click the call widget, we are now focused on that function call, and we can edit just this function. The arguments of the function also appear, allowing us to perform standard generic refactorings on the arguments, like, for example, reordering them, or if you hit the X, you could remove them. Um, in this case, we maybe we want to add an argument. We'd really like to be able to draw leaves of different colors, so I can select the, uh, the, the polygon there, select its fill color, and go to add argument and it will insert that argument into the function for us. I'll call it fill. There we go. But the reason we focus this function is because we wanted to draw the other, the other vein into it. So I can select the line tool, and because I'm focused on the function, when I draw the line in the rhombus, it will now insert that line inside my function here, uh, as, as, as intended. All right, we're almost done, but these Red is kind of an ugly color for our lines. We really want it to be the same color as the stroke for our rhombus there. So we'll quickly make those, all those the same color. We'll select the color for one line, select the color for the other line, and then select the stroke color of the rhombus here. It's right it's peeking out there. And then we'll tell Sketch and Sketch to introduce a variable to make all those things the same, to make them equal. And so we'll do that here. And then now all my lines are the, the same color as intended. So I can unfocus the function now, and because they, uh, the, these function calls are different, we can change the line, the color for each of these, each, each of these rhombuses uh, separately. So we do this one over here, like so. So we have built a program with a reusable design, and we're able to do it without any text edits, only using the uh, direct manipulation features. Let me switch back to the slides. So how were we able to do that? Well, we relied on the fact that a lot of the intermediate execution products in our program were exposed for us by, with widgets. So for example, the point widgets, the offset widgets, the list widgets, and the call widgets. We also relied on the fact that we could focus on a particular expression to edit within that expression. And then throughout, we used several generic refactorings that you might find in multiple IDEs, but we could invoke them from the out output. Now, what other kinds of designs can you create using all these features? We uh, implemented the 16 parametric drawings shown here in the slide, including this recursive fractal and several designs involving rep repetition. And we were able to do all of these without any text edits. We only used the direct manipulation features I, I just showed you. Now, so what, what can the system not do? Well, several of our, our designs were drawn from a benchmark suite that was proposed in Watch What I Do, Programming by Demonstration. We were able to complete four of their benchmark tasks completely, and then mostly complete another two. There are nine other parametric drawings in the benchmark suite that we need, we'd need more features to complete. Most notably, we'd need to be able to draw text boxes and then position elements relative to the text size. After that, there's a long tail of more specialized features that, uh, that would be required. So that's one avenue for future work. We could fill in some of these mis missing features. But more broadly, there's some bigger questions. So, for example, if you're going to start exposing widgets for the intermediate execution products, well, your program could have a lot of intermediate execution steps, and there can be way too many widgets cluttering the canvas. Right now, we only show widgets if you hover over an associated shape, and that helps a little bit, but we need some, we need some better techniques here to avoid the clutter. 
And then finally, this output directed programming raises a tantalizing question, which is, you know, could you make programming as easy as using a graphics editor? And, well, we don't answer that question. We've only shown that output directed programming is possible. We haven't shown that it's easy. So future work should look at uh, specifically what would be needed to, to, help novice, to help novices in this area. All right. To sum it up, we allowed you to directly manipulate more than just the output of your program using widgets that expose intermediate execution products and allowing you to just uh, focus your editing on a single definition. We also tried to embrace generic programmatic concepts, most um, notably by having generic refactorings that you could uh, invoke from the output. If you'd like to play with the tool, you can just look online for Sketch and Sketch or find our table at the demo session tonight. Thank you for listening. I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah, so last questions. Um, thanks for the great talk, and this is really exciting work. So on that last point of widget visibility, um, it seems like that's a common problem, and I've encountered similar problems with just with more complex programs, you start to clutter the space. It seems like there's a ceiling for that, like where hiding and showing various widgets is, is not no longer going to be a, a viable option. Have you thought about other approaches for helping people navigate complex, visually represented systems that go beyond just like showing widgets when you're hovering over them, you know, and maybe building off of some other approaches from programming and helping people to navigate complex code structures? Yeah, thanks for the question. And yeah, it is a big problem. Uh, I, I can say the only ideas I've had off the top of my head is that some of these widgets, you could consolidate some of them into one. Like, oh, you clicked on this. Maybe you meant to click one of these five things, and we'll figure it out later. Or you could have a very nested menu structure uh, when you're trying to think, figure things out. But yeah, it's, it's, it's an important problem. Hi, it's Scott Clemmer from San Diego. I was curious if you've tried showing people multiple alternatives. Like, I still love Michael Terry's work from almost 20 years ago now, where it would give you, you know, multiple different options. And it seems like for something like drawing a, a rhombus, where there's, a, you know, there's a few different constraints you can have for a four-sided thing. Could you say, oh, you know, the most common one is this, so we'll show that in the main area, and maybe we have some, you know, ghost UI or or world in miniature UI that shows you. Uh, uh, also valid, but less common alternatives. Yeah, so I didn't emphasize it, but the tools, when you have the, each of the tools does all, usually produce more than one result, and we just kind of hid them, because sometimes there's a lot to show, and you could click and see more of the results. Um, a long time ago, we did experiment with an interface that would show you those results kind of side by side, uh, uh, but, and right now, but right now we're just look, relying on people reading the diffs. So, um, yeah. Any other questions? I have a question. How do you handle uh, repetition or loop? For example, if you draw five boxes and then system automatically generate four loop? Or... Yeah, so we don't have a looping construct. Specifically, it's a functional language. Um, but we do have a couple tools for repetition. If you collect a shape and you say repeat it over a, a list of points, it'll take, you can take a list of points and a shape, and it'll try and repeat it that shape over the list of points. So that's, uh, that's one interaction we have. I see. Any other questions? OK, so that's, uh, let's thank the speaker.